when it comes to low power silicon, our high performance core is the world's fastest CPU core. I'm floored. Have you guys seen this? Hi, I'm Justin, and today we're taking a look at the brand new M1 Apple silicon chip. It's a game changer. That's right, Apple finally decided to get into the chip making business for desktop and laptop computers. Now they've been making chips for their iPhone, iPad, and other Apple devices for about 10 years now, but never have they ventured into computer chip making, which is really interesting because in only 10 years, Apple beat out AMD and Intel in what they took 50 years to do. Now that's really interesting to me because this is only the beginning. This is their very first desktop class chip and it's blowing the competition out of the water. Before we get into comparisons with this brand new M1 Apple Silicon chip and other chips that are currently on the market, let's go ahead and talk about what's so special about the M1 chip. The M1 chip is an entirely new SOC or system on a chip combining the CPU, GPU, RAM, and other pieces that a computer would need to run. This allows for an insane boost in performance, simply because all of those individual pieces have access to the same shared memory. They don't have to crawl around the motherboard to find each other. They're all on one chip, which means that really quickly they can access that memory. And Apple went all out with the CPU and GPU both having eight cores, four of which being high performance and four of which being high efficiency. That means that tasks that don't necessarily need a lot of compute power are going to run off of those high efficiency cores and take up much less battery and energy. And when you really need that extra amount of performance, it's going to use the high performance cores to allow you to pull in that extra performance right when you need it. Okay, so what's the big deal? More cores, everything's on a single chip, but what does that actually mean? What are the statistics that we can look at? Let's go ahead and take a look at what Apple said at their event. Apple said that you can get up to a three times processing power boost over their previous gen Intel chips that were in these devices, a six times graphics boost, and an incredible 15 times faster machine learning performance on these new chips. Now, all of that was accomplished while still allowing for up to two times the battery life with the MacBook Pro 13 inch that they put the M1 chip in having up to 20 hours of battery life. That's insane. That's ultimately two and a half work days of not charging your battery uh, before it finally dies. That to me is mind blowing. The amount of compute power that they've been able to stuff in this tiny little chip and how they've been able to extend the battery life at the same time is insane. It's, it's a game changer because nothing to my knowledge comes remotely close at this price point at this form factor uh, with this amount of performance and battery life. It's, it's incredible. And what's really amazing is that this M1 chip is just the first iteration. This is the very beginning for Apple. They've got a long road ahead of them with chip making. And I'm really excited to see where it's going to go because it's, it's insane in the beginning, right? They've only taken 10 years to beat out Intel and AMD with what they do best. And I'm really excited to see where Apple takes this over the coming years as they continue to iterate and to get better at making chips. Now, mind you, a lot of the things that I've said thus far are how it looks on paper, right? That's how Apple said it is. But how do we know as consumers that it's actually that good? Well, this video is a little bit later than others, uh, but what that means is I've been able to see benchmarks, tests, etc on how the chip actually stands up to the competition, and it is very good. Uh, there, are, there are a few drawbacks to this new chip. It really does perform incredibly well. For instance, the new MacBook Air can actually uh, edit two streams of 4K at the exact same time, and the MacBook Air is fanless. So imagine what Apple can do when they put their brand new silicon into items such as the Mac Pro and the higher end MacBook Pros. Now, if we actually look at benchmark tests for the new M1 chip, it stacks up pretty well. In fact, I'm really disappointed, unfortunately, to say that a lot of these new benchmarks are putting the brand new M1 MacBook Air above the 2019 16-inch MacBook Pro, which I have. And that's unfortunate because that is quite a bit more expensive, yet it's not as good. 
And that's crazy to me that the MacBook Air, which is not a professional grade device, it's not meant for pros, right? It's better, it's performing better anyway, than the uh, previous generation MacBook Pro, which should be much more powerful. Uh, now, I'm really interested to see how that's going to play into Apple putting their chips into the newer devices, uh, such as the higher end MacBook Pros, such as the iMac uh, and the Mac Pro. Because currently all they've done is put it in the entry level 13 inch Pros, the MacBook Air and the Mac Mini, all of which are meant more for efficiency, for energy saving, etc., and may not have the performance boost that Pros are looking for. It'll be interesting to see what that looks like in the next generation. Okay, so we've gone over a lot of the pros. What are the cons of this brand new chip? Well, there's a couple. First of all, the brand new Mac mini doesn't have 10 gigabit ethernet, which is really interesting. It draws, or it goes back uh, to one gigabit, which we're not quite sure why. Uh, a lot of people looked into it and there are some uh, thoughts on limitations of the M1 chip, specifically that it can't support that quite yet. And so that may be something that comes back uh, with M2 or M3 or whatever they decide to call it at that point. Some other drawbacks is that you can't use an external GPU, which is really going to be a hindrance to professionals who want to plug in more graphics power to their uh, machines. It's not possible. It's not compatible with the M1 chip whatsoever. The last item that is of importance, uh, especially for somebody like me, is that boot camp is actually not supported either which means that you're going to have to use something like Parallels to boot into Windows on your brand new M1 Mac. Now, that may be something that they fix in the future again, but it's not supported out of the gate with their brand new M1 chip. Uh, and so that's something that you would want to think about if you're deciding whether to buy the brand new M1 uh, Apple Silicon MacBooks or Mac Mini, or if you want to wait until the next generation comes out uh, to see if it is supported at that time. One thing that computer enthusiasts are going to find is that the spec sheet for these processors across three different bodies, right, or computers, is exactly the same with the exception of mostly the RAM. Um, you can choose between eight gigabytes or 16 gigabytes of RAM. And because it's a system on a chip or one chip integrating all of the different pieces, there are no upgrades once you choose. Uh, you'll have to get a, a completely new device to be able to upgrade. So there's no more RAM upgrades. Uh, there's no more solid state upgrades in these devices because everything is on a single chip. And so you're going to need to decide and future-proof your buying decisions with these new devices because you get what you get and you can't change that after the fact. But for enthusiasts, what's really interesting is you have to decide what body you want this device to to come in because the chip is the same, right? There's there's no more um, gigahertz to look at necessarily. Apple hasn't uh, released that information to this point. And so you really get to decide, you know, what chip do I want that to come in? Uh, do I get the Mac mini? Do I get the MacBook Air? Do I get the MacBook Pro? And I think a lot of it comes down to form factor and also the thermal profile of the device because the MacBook Pro has a fan in it. And so it's going to allow for the device to be more performant, I think, because what I assume is going to happen is that although it's the same chip, in the MacBook Air, it's going to throttle down based on how much heat is being created uh, due to the tasks that you're running on the device. And that's to make sure that the device doesn't overheat. Whereas the MacBook Pro is going to allow you probably to do a little bit more because it does have that fan and cooling system built in. It's going to allow for that heat to disperse better. And so it's going to be able to do much more because heat isn't necessarily an issue. It doesn't need to throttle down as much. Now, for those who understand architecture a little bit out there, you'll know that these new M1 chips aren't going to natively support these older Intel applications. And that's because the architecture between the two chips aren't compatible. And so how do we overcome that? Uh, well, the first step is developers go ahead and develop their apps and build them for the new architecture and distribute both applications, one built for each. Now, that's not always going to be an option for older applications with smaller teams or immediately out of the gate for a lot of these bigger applications. And so Apple developed what's called Rosetta 2. 
It's actually really incredible what it does. It emulates that application uh, from Intel and emulates it over to the new M1 architecture so that in theory, it runs plain as day, just the same as it did before. Now there are going to be some drawbacks. Number one, it's emulated. So it's not running on bare metal, which means it's going to run a little bit slower. Uh, there are going to be some hiccups that you find, whether that be in games, uh, frame rate drop, some uh, pulling of the display, some stretching. Uh, in applications, it may be that there are errors or things that aren't quite working yet. Uh, but what it does allow is for the most part an experience that you can pull over most of your applications and they'll run the same. Now, if you're a professional and you rely on these applications for your job, such as Photoshop, you may want to hold off simply because they aren't quite yet ready out of the gate and the developers are going to need some time to allow it to run natively on the new M1 ship. I've had a lot of people ask me whether they should actually go in and buy the brand new M1 Apple Silicon devices. I think the answer varies. Uh, something that you're going to need to think about is that you're ultimately a beta tester at this point, right? It's their first attempt at a desktop class chip. And so you're going to be without knowing it, really giving them feedback. Um, you're going to be the first few individuals to be testing this. And so with most things that are first iterations, there are some hiccups. And so that's something that you're going to need to think about. Um, the price point that they put these new devices at matches or beats what they previously had with Intel chips. Uh, the MacBook Pro and the MacBook Air match, and the Mac Mini is actually $100 cheaper. So what you're going to find is that these devices are incredibly performant, incredibly efficient, insane battery life, right? You're able to edit multiple streams of 4K footage. Uh, it's beating out a lot of these new powerful devices uh, in benchmarks. Um, but you're going to also need to realize that there are some things that you're giving up, such as 10 gigabit ethernet on the Mac mini, external GPUs, the ability to use uh, bootcamp to go into Windows. Uh, and other things such as native support for certain apps, right? You're, you're able to use Rosetta 2 to essentially emulate those uh, applications on this new architecture, but it may come with some uh, performance uh, degradations simply because you're running it emulated instead of natively right on bare metal. And so when you're thinking, should I buy this new device? I think the answer comes down to two things. Are you a professional and do you use this device for your job? If the answer is yes, I would probably wait a bit. Make sure that the applications that you use are actually supported, such as Photoshop, which isn't going to come out natively until next year, 2021. Uh, the other question is, is this your first time using a Mac? If the answer is yes, I think that you should definitely go for the new M1 Apple Silicon chip because it's an incredible deal, incredibly performant, and since it's your first time, you have a clean slate, uh, there's not a lot of compatibility issues that you're going to need to worry about. So ultimately, I think that it's definitely worth it. Um, I do think though, that you need to use some judgment because there are some downsides to these new chips, but there are some huge upsides. And I'm incredibly interested to see what Apple's going to do over the next few years uh, and how they improve upon this already incredible chipset that they've created. Well, that's it for today. If you like what you see, subscribe to me and we'll see you next time.